I'm going to show you a little bit about everything in Resolve, because if you're familiar with Resolve, uh, it's organized in these pages at the bottom. Essentially, we represent different stages of the workflow, um, but all wrapped up in this, in this you know, one uh, unicorn of a package. So if you look at the bottom with me, you'll see that I'm in the media page. So in the media page, as you would expect, this is where we really start to organize the media that we import. Now I say import rather than ingest because um, you know media doesn't have to move when, when we import it. The media doesn't get transcoded, it doesn't move anywhere else. So just keep that in mind when you're importing stuff to resolve. I'm looking up here at this quadrant, this top left corner. This is the media storage panel. And as you'll see, there's you know some drives connected. There's some media here. There's some favorites even places that I want to I want to grab my media. It's it's very simple. Um, in fact, it's pretty easy if I just open the Finder for a minute to show you something. If I needed to find my way down and drill through this ridiculous hierarchy just to find that one file that's listed here, the Hyperlite ADR text, if I drag this one file just directly over to the, the media storage window. Well, I, I dab away up here. There we go. All right, so if I drag this file over, what you see is that it's going to try and find a way for me to you know, point directly to this directory. So here, let's do that. See this plus, right? It simply drags me to this in media storage. So if you look up here, it's found my hierarchy. And there I am, Mac, HD, apps, IBC, et cetera. Um, so this is just, you know, keep that in mind, real simple methods of, of navigating around in here. But this is your actual connected storage. So you don't want to throw away your media from this window, right? There's no, you know, let's not delete permanently, which you see at the very bottom there, right? Delete permanently. OK. So don't, don't do that, all right? <laughs> There, now, now that I've warned you. Okay, so we bring media in very simply. We either drag it down here or we take the whole folder structure, hierarchy, et cetera, and drag it straight down. It'll create this, this organization, right? This is just an explicitly organized set of bins or folders or directories. And, you know, that's, that's a great starting point. Maybe you come in with your particular documentary editorial workflow predefined. I've got a folder structure that I, like to, that I like to work with all the time. I drag that whole folder straight in. I have empty bins. I start, I start organizing. And if we just look at that, we've got media here. If I wanted to make any selections on this media, if I wanted to see its relevant metadata, you'll see this metadata panel in the bottom right-hand corner. If you follow the bouncing mouse right there, Let's just go ahead and say all groups. I'm going to take this full height, just uh, tagging the little caret there at the top. This is going to show me all of the available metadata mat uh, uh, attributes excuse me, that we can control and keep track of and represent, and in fact, sort by. So if, for instance, this shot had some shot, scene, take, angle information, uh, if the sound person, you know, added copious metadata to this, and you see there's very little metadata on this particular file, then we can actually extract that. We can use that to help sort our, you know, our finder folder structure, our hierarchy, et cetera, the bins that we want. Those things are called smart bins. So if you look underneath this organization, you know, this massive and specifically defined organizational structure that I've got here for the, for the bins, you look at the bottom, there's something called a smart bin. And that's here in this bottom left side. If I click it, the only thing that I have in a smart bin now is I've enabled the one preference in the preferences file. So if I look up under resolve and I look at preferences, this is the super boring stuff, but I, I like to show this stuff because at the very least, you'll understand how I set it up to work. Now, user side preferences, for instance, these don't require restarts, just FYI, because you're not making any changes to the system settings. But if you start tweaking things like your video and audio IO, or you want to define the, the memory that Resolve has access to, or specific GPUs that you want to assign. Maybe you've got a rack of a chassis you know, sitting externally connected with four GPUs in there. Perhaps you want to specifically define how to use them or how to process them. This is the panel that you, that you set that in. If you make changes here to the system side, when I click Save, it's actually going to ask me to restart. But if I make changes to the user side, this is just user-only preference. And that's really important to know as, a, as an, you know, an editor who might come into another environment 
and have to sit down at this station. So three dot menus exist everywhere in Resolve. And, and just make sure wherever you see one, you click it, because there's something hidden in here. Right now, you'll see I click the three dot menu. I have save as user preset. I have import. I have reset. So if I had actually saved these, you'd see it listed under here, and I could select that. And that's really important, because maybe I prefer a certain number of frames on my post playhead shadow length. And there, there's that checkbox that I told you I was going to find by opening the preferences. Create smart bin for timelines. So I turn that on by default all the time. You can come into this section and tweak this to your heart's content, save out the preset that you want, and then you can load up your user environment when you get back into it. Same with color. You'll see that there's some presets to define here in the color side, as well as playback settings. Uh, control panels, this of course is adjusting the sensitivity of the control panels that you use if you're using our DaVinci Resolve you know, uh, color control panels. There's a mini panel with us over there at the desk. Ah, see, we even have a little, you gotta do this. You gotta like, you know, wave your arm across, right? So there it is, there's the mini panel. Thank you, sir, appreciate that. The, uh, the mini panel is kind of the, the middle of the panel uh, group. We have a micro panel, a little bit smaller than that one, just a little bit shorter than that one. Um, all really well built, molded, um, aluminum. The mini panel has the two screens on top. It actually has a, a little riser with direct access controls. This is, this is incredibly important you know, when you're talking about um, trying to replicate the, the color workflow. The advanced control panel is a three-sectional panel that is about as long as this desk right here. So it's not going to be in everyone's workflow. It's not going to be in everyone's facility. But uh, the mini panel over there is roughly 85% of those tools. And you might have to po you know, push a button to get through maybe a sub-menu that you didn't have to do. But then again, if you're not in a supervised session with the $30,000 advanced control panel, this is probably going to be good for you. Um, and here is where you set those controls. So let's get out of the preferences again. <clears throat> I've just shown you what smart bins are, uh, but I didn't show you how to create one. So if I just right click in that area and say, add new smart bin, right? It brings up this create smart bin dialog box. I can type in uh, the name of the smart bin I'm looking for. In this case, let's say any media pool properties name contains Emiliana, because I know in this shot, this is Hyperlight, which we used at NAB last year. It's a little uh, um, sci-fi short film. And the lead character is Emiliana. Well, there's two, there's two leads, Emiliana and Philip. So if I just say Emiliana and create the smart bin, I want to show you what happens to that bin, because essentially this could be your workflow. You could come in, define blank empty bins for your hierarchy as you're used to having them, Set up a few smart bins. Say, look, I know I'm going to have some dialogue interplay in this short between Emiliana and Philip. So I'm going to set up a smart bin for my Emiliana clips, my smart bin for my Philip clips. I'm going to set up a, uh, maybe a bin for my two shots if I want to get super specific, or you know, ECUs or, or whip pans. What, whatever I choose, I can actually I can sort that. So let's show you what that does. If I grab, well, let's just let's grab all of it. You see that I just shift selected multiple bins. That gives me this one giant bin that shows me everything I've got. Um, I'm going to take a moment to show you what this is while I'm doing it. But the first thing I want to do is I just want to show you this function here. So if I said, yeah, these three clips that I've just shift selected um, contiguously, I'm going to add metadata to those clips here. And I'm going to put them in the I'm going to put them in a keywords section. This is Emiliana. Okay, I hit return. You see the checkbox comes up because this is when I'm actually adding metadata to multiple clips. Checkbox comes up. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. Great, save it. Now I've applied this metadata to multiple clips. If I just had a single clip and said, well, you know, I know this is Philip. I just hit return. Philip has already added. I didn't have to say save or anything like that. This is just part of the way that the metadata functions. So when I come back um, to the smart bin, I notice that I actually changed, or you know, what I, what I asked it to sort by was file name. So let's actually show what I asked for, which is keywords. So as soon as I type, I want keywords, and again, I exited before I filled it out. Um, Emiliana, I just start typing Emiliana, and if I move that out of the way, 
you'll see that those three clips that I've actually added metadata to have filtered automatically. So having created my smart bins, having explicitly created bins, this is the, the first thing that I'm going to do. I'm going to start by organizing all of my media. Um, as I select a clip, all of its tools show up on the right-hand side. This includes all the metadata that I'm, I'm showing you right now, in addition to maybe the audio metadata. So if I'm looking at, say, the 5.1, and I needed to sync media, I can show this clip and its waveform here, and you can see at the top of this little thing in red is highlighted with A1-001. This is the file name itself. If I needed a force sync between this and you know another clip that didn't actually have any audio or something that I wanted to sync and just force here, let's just say it's this one right here. MedLab, sound effects, ProRes, great. So if this is the clip that I wanted to force sync with, you see that I've still got the audio clip loaded because it was the first one that I chose. And I selected it here in the audio tab. Now up above on the, on the viewer here in the media page, I've actually got another clip. And it's identified with this salmon red or I don't know what we want to call that color red. Um, but this is our color red, so you'll see this everywhere. And we've got this little red outline around it, right? It indicates it's metadata here for the clip. Uh, there's the name, etc. If you look over here, it's got one channel of production audio. And what I want to do is I want to add the two channels that I have here. So if I just, for instance, let's assume these are shot at the same time but without time code, and I've got some method of syncing these visually, like you know the slate comes in and I see where the slate lands. And that, that becomes my cue. So if I were to find that visual cue here on the clip and then find that visual cue here on the waveform itself and call these the sync points, I can just force sync with these two. I didn't actually have to sync it with its time code. I didn't have to sync it with the audio waveform that they were both recording because perhaps that camera file that I have here didn't actually have any audio in it. And I needed to force a way to sync it because um, I wouldn't have any other method in that case. Now, if I were to grab, say, all of these audio files and just show you the normal method for doing this, if this, which is actually the Fairlight capture, let's go to my stems there. All right, so there's, there's the stem. If I said that, and I'll just open these. If I said this clip and this clip, well, here, non-contiguous, my bad. There we go. Right click on those two, and you'll see that auto sync audio near the lower half, like the lower third of this window here. Uh, auto sync based on audio, uh, sorry, based on time code or waveform. Now, again, this is assuming that you know, you've shot them with the same time code. You're feeding time code to every camera and every recording device, every sound device. Uh, based on waveform, if they were actually recording the same material and, they, and you have you know, two channels on camera and you have your sound device and you were not feeding them time code, you'd be able to sync on waveform. But even outside of those two automatic functions, and it's very simple, I just click the button, and when it finds them, it syncs them, it links those two clips. Even outside of that, the manual syncing option gives me even greater uh, um, you know, flexibility there. So uh, now I've made some selections, and I want to talk about what that looks like, because I can either do this select, and, and I can create polls from right here from the media page. In fact, what you're looking at is usage indicators. The little red lines underneath are usage indicators. So you'll see that they've been cut into a timeline somewhere. So if I'm really just looking through my bin, uh, maybe I'm doing so in the you know, giant thumbnails, I just want to see you know, where's a clip that I can use that I haven't already cut in. There's, a, there's well, clearly there's one right here. You know, this is the one that doesn't have any indicators. So quick visual indicator to tell you when you've used something. This is just you know, all trying to make you uh, that much more efficient in using the program. Now, <clears throat> as you see, as I'm hovering over with the mouse, I have something called Live Media Preview turned on. And again, I told you to look for those three-dot menus, right? So if we look above the viewer at the three-dot menu, that's where it is. That's where you select it. Live Media Preview is on there. Um, if I turn that off, of course, then it functions normally. Click to load in the viewer, scrub here. The same thing, you know, J, K, and L as you're expecting for the shuttle. Um, there's actually even a little scrubber here, which you might not know. 
If you hover the mouse over this area and drag, click and drag, you'll see that it acts as like a scroll wheel, a scrub wheel. Um, if this right here is, say, the, the beginning of the move that I want, I can just use keyboard shortcuts at this point, you know, I to mark in, O to mark out, right there where he's blinking, maybe just before the blink, there we go, O to mark out. Um, what you see about this clip here that's loaded below in this media page is that I've now marked an in-out select range, and it's indicated by those vertical white lines. So in addition to the usage meter that we have here at the bottom, we have the vertical white lines indicating our actual selects. So just more ways that we give you to pull exactly the, the type of shots that you want and help you organize this. So moving on, because we've made all of our selects, right, now it's time to actually cut them into the timeline. So I wanted to show the timeline and some of the new features that are in 15, because this timeline and this interface isn't exactly that new. We all recognize an NLE that has a linear timeline and a source viewer and a record or a program viewer, right? So we're not changing that. Um, you, in fact, I find that a lot of people liken this to, you know, some of their favorite NLEs from the past. <laughs> right? Okay. So... Uh, <laughs> Uh, and in that sense, you know, aesthetically, it certainly has some, some familiarity there. But I'll tell you that uh, what's under the hood is so significantly improved from, from that older version. Uh, this, is, this is now, you know, nowhere near that. And it's not just because we've added so many other pages, because clearly we keep adding a whole bunch of functions, um, and not the least of which was Fusion in, in version 15, which I'm definitely going to get into. But if you just look at the edit page, and if the edit page is your entire home, or if it's the majority of the place that you expect to, to spend your time, um, you know, the majority of your time would be spent in the edit page. Just thinking of the tools that we've provided for you, um, as you see, as I hover over that marker, the marker actually indicates, uh, you know, hover over if I land on that marker, for instance, which we can do with, you know, shortcuts as well. And all the shortcuts are customizable because we don't really want to tell you necessarily how you'd like to edit best, you know, what, what makes it easier for you. Um, if we look back here up under the Resolve Preference menu area, right under the DaVinci Resolve menu, you'll see we have a separate area called Keyboard Customization now. <clears throat> so if you're new-ish to Resolve or Resolve 15, you'll see that this is a huge change from, from version 14. In fact, this is a change from, from the very first one that we released in version 15. And this gives us the ability to decide, you know, we want, we want to look at just the edit or media viewer activity, and we want to look at only the functionality from the edit page. And then it filters to the right. It shows us the kind of things that we can customize. And in fact, if we just click in here, you'll see it allows us to customize just that easily. Or any of these, as I hover over, anything that's already been defined, we can redefine. And anything that I've changed, you see at the very top here, near that three-dot menu I've told you to look for, uh, it says DaVinci Resolve. You'll also see that there's three other basic presets, and then there's something over here that someone has customized and named one. And that's because we can just change our presets, import, export presets. We can start with presets from the other, the other tools. So if you come from another tool and you're, and you're already more familiar with, you know, with the, the Media Composer, or you're more familiar with, I don't know, what is this one called? What, how do you pronounce that one? I'm sorry. Is that, yes, all right, you guys know this one, right? Okay, great. So you are familiar with them. So if you want to start with those tools, uh, keyboard shortcuts, please go right ahead. In fact, you can start with any of these and then just customize them to suit you. So if you like half of the Premiere tools the way that they are and you like, you know, you want to take some of ours as well. Um, an awful lot of ours, I'll be honest, they are, uh, they cross over with FCP 7 shortcuts. So, you know, when the playhead, when the playhead is over a clip, as it is here, if you hit X on the keyboard, right, marks in and out of that clip. It's really useful, and it's something that is muscle memory for a lot of people. So um, just, just know that you can completely customize this to your, to your heart's content. You can save those presets, and you can share them around. You can take a preset with you if, if you're allowed to bring an actual USB stick to a facility. I don't know. Not every facility will allow you to do this, right? But perhaps, maybe you could email it to them in advance so that it goes through their, their process, and then they'll allow it to, to load up. But just imagine that you can actually customize this, which is really useful. 
So edit page functions, um, we're looking at the normal edit tool right now, which is just this, this arrow pointer, right? Everyone understands what an arrow does, or most people tend to understand what an arrow does, right? It's the selection tool. I can click and move up you know, in the track, I can slide the clip. You see that it's actually just overriding wherever it needs to when I'm using the normal edit tool. If I were to do similar things with, say, the, um, the trim tool, which if I hover over, and here let's just hover and let go for a minute, it's actually gonna tell me what that is. Trim edit mode is just T. So if I click it or hit T on the keyboard, I've switched my tool. And this is important because if I needed to make a trim to this, Perhaps I'm trimming the head of the tail of this clip, um, and I don't want to create a gap. I want to ripple everything together. Maybe, and I'll show you that now. So if I mouse over to the edge, and I wonder if this is going to help me out here. Uh, there we go. Let's just use the shortcuts to zoom in for you. All right. So as I mouse over the head and tail, um, you'll see that it changes. The icon itself actually changes. So here we go. Let's grab and perform a trim on the head end of this clip, right? Oh, look, I've actually created a gap. So I'll show you that too, because clearly there's a gap here that I couldn't see when I was moving it around showing you last time. So let's just go ahead and add that. Um, because the normal edit tool will create a gap when I trim from the head of this clip, or it'll overwrite based on where it is. In this case, I'm overwriting the tail of the previous clip. So let's leave it there. And I'm going to zoom out again. So now, switching back to the trim tool, as I grab from the head of this clip, you'll see that it's rippling the rest of my timeline. If this rippling process isn't what you're interested in, because you don't necessarily want to take the, uh, the sound track with you, or in this case, maybe the low background noise, uh, like the drone. There's no music in this cut right now, so don't necessarily have to worry about the music. But if I wanted to keep their dialogue in sync, then any sync sound clips, <clears throat> this would be really useful for your, for your trimming functions, right? Whether head or tail. You see that it's actually pulling everything back based on where the, the trim is, where the edit location is. And all of this can be done with the keyboard. As I showed you all the keyboard shortcuts, you know, V, V jumps to, I'm not sure if you say, saw this, but if I move the mouse around this area, just hitting V on the keyboard jumped to my nearest um, edit point that I can perform an edit to. So that means I can actually perform edits, you know, with, uh, with the keys, you know, minus 21 frames as I did there. That's just the ripple trim minus 21 because I have the ripple tool. I have the trim edit mode engaged. If I'm in normal edit mode, which would happen if I just switch to the, to the tool, so here. Uh, normal edit mode, performing the same function, right, actually just creates the new, here we go, let's just say V minus, right, drops the gap in there, which I don't necessarily always want to do. Keeping in mind that the ripple is by default enabled on the trim tool, uh, it's important to also learn what these are. These are the little auto selects, which if you've worked with other software, this is kind of like a, like a sync lock. Um, so if I'm, if I'm talking about, you know, this dialogue here and a ripple function is going gonna, is gonna to roll this, but what I really want to do is just I want to see Philip's reaction now. I don't want to ripple that dialogue underneath. I, just, I would prefer to just roll this edit point. Well, that tool will actually still allow me to roll, but you see it's still attached. It is until I disable that. So now I can actually force it out of sync. So just keep that in mind when we're talking about the way that these tools work. Um, there's, there's, you know, a, a method to the madness. The other thing that's next to this is actually the dynamic trim mode. So if I'm looking at the trim mode, and here, let me show you again the four options in the trim mode. I only showed you the, the trimming, the, the head and the tail. Um, if I click right here in this upper area, say where the picture is, or the, just this upper above the, the line, you can actually see that it's changing. The icon changes as I move below the line. So this is, this is the first thing I want to show you. As I do that, then this is performing a slip function. And I'm actually slipping my edit of the clip in the timeline without regard for its, its edited position or its, or its duration, right? It's just a typical slip. If I, if I move this 
function down, I actually have a slide. In fact, I have a slide and I have an indicator for how far I could slide this particular clip based on the edit points of the previous and the next clips coming up. And that's indicated with those little white lines. So again, as we give you these cool tools, we kind of show you some great stuff and not everyone's gonna touch it with the mouse like I am to see this. You know, you're probably gonna get super fast with it and, and switch off to keyboard. Most people tend to just do a, a combination of, of keyboard or keyboard and mouse. Or I tend to have my left hand on the keyboard all the time um, unless I'm demoing because if I'm up here and I'm touching all the keyboard shortcuts that you can't see, it really doesn't help any of you. So I'm gonna use the mouse basically all the time right now. But just know that everything is keyboard. Um, I mentioned dynamic trim, and that's important here too because I'm in the normal trim mode, but if I was in the dynamic trim mode, this is actually just W on the keyboard, or if I switch to it, you'll see that there's two functions. Right now, slide is in parentheses, and you'll see that slip is also an option. So slide is default selected here, and that means that you know if I just use the J, K, and L keys, I can actually, with that selected clip now that you've seen, right, I can use the J, K, and L keys to just slide this down, uh, you know, back and forth in the range that I have with just keyboard shortcuts. So again, you can fly this whole thing with the keyboard. Um, don't, don't think that it doesn't have editorial tools that are mature enough for you to actually take over and use this as your primary NLE. Um, I challenge you to, and, and come up to me, and tell me, and, and I'll take it. That's fine, I'll take it. Tell me where it, where it falls down because this is kind of my job at the company. And when I, <clears throat> when I identify things that, that, you know, maybe I get some great, great feedback and great suggestions, right? Uh, I get great suggestions, I try and collate a list, and I talk to the development team, and I, and I try and, you know, talk them into my way of doing it, maybe, and say, this is, this is a real world workflow, I've, I've visited customers, this is how they're using it, you know, this facility, this studio, um, this independent film, whatever it is, it's important. And when I identify those places that it needs to improve, that's really what I love doing the most because then I can write it all up. And <clears throat> you probably know that we have incredibly responsive developers constantly developing, right? We come out with a new version of this basically at NAB every year, right? NAB went from uh, version 14 to version 15. And yes, we release it in beta at NAB, uh, there's, there's a several month beta involved in that, obviously, to help, you know, uh, get the feedback that we need to make the improvements, et cetera. But just know that, that they're, um, they're lightning fast and, um, and they really do appreciate the kind of feedback that I'm able to get from, from real world end users. So I would love to hear from you. Um, tell, me, tell me why you can't use it for editorial and then, and then I'll bring that back to them because we want to get that changed. I mean, I know why a lot of people don't use it for editorial, right? I mean, if we're talking about um, a union lot, you know, you're talking about the, the, the restrictions, you're talking about uh, a segmented workflow or a siloed workflow, maybe you're just, you're just one aspect of that workflow and, um, you know, somebody says here, this is your project, it came off of the, came off of the other company, um, so import that AAF or XML and, and then go to town. Um, you can cut from scratch in here. I've, I have, uh, well not scratch, and I'm sorry I kicked your light here. Let's just move that back, here we go. I, I move around too much, I guess, to have stuff behind me, so yeah. keep that in mind, I guess. Just put me in, in, a, in a locked region next time. So, um, yeah, you bring, in your, you bring in your exchange format, you, you, you know, do the normal process for conform, and then, and then you rebuild things that you have to rebuild that didn't necessarily come across, because not everything comes across. You know, we, we try to match most of everything, and we play really well with all of the other companies. Uh, we've got a, a great response, um, you know, from, from AAF into, into a resolved timeline. Same thing with XML, obviously, you know, there are caveats there. If you can cut and resolve, you bypass all of that, right? Uh, the other thing that you get is typically the workflow comes into you and you've got somebody else's exported low res proxy, you know, with the LUT slammed on it, burn in and the whole, the whole nine yards, um, and none of the metadata, <clears throat> right? Because it comes out and it just gets stripped out of the exchange. So clearly if you can hold metadata the entire length of this project from end to end, you're going to be so much better uh, and so much more efficient. 
Uh, it means that certain things can be scriptable. It means that you know if you had to do VFX turnovers uh, and you've got a string out for pulls, then you could potentially have them scripted to render farm all from within Resolve because one of the new features that we've added along with adding, 15, uh, adding Fusion in 15 is the ability to script in Python. Um, there's Python and Lewis script support in here, so some people that are actually putting this into their, you know, their pipelines <clears throat> can integrate this and can can create, you know, headless timelines and and uh, very advanced workflows. So just just know that it's capable, and and I feel very strongly that it that it can do it. Obviously, you can't take that to the bank, but you can certainly come at me. All right, you're like, hey, you told me this is going to work. Uh, what did I do wrong, or you know, why isn't it? And and I will take all that. I, I will take all that. All right, so uh, let's move on. Uh, the editorial tools are kind of as you would expect. We have some of the transformation uh, options here. So uh, let me get out of the dynamic trim and go to the normal mode. This clip here, um, <coughs> excuse me, this clip under the timeline, some more, some more quick shortcuts real quick. Um, v, just shift V, selects the clip itself. V selects the edit point, right? So just I'm going to hand those out every now and then because I use them all the time. So Shift V, and I just created a little outline around that clip. That means I can actually perform some functions on it. With that clip outlined and identified, you'll see that its tools appear in the inspector. So all I've done is I moved up to the top right-hand window, and I've opened the inspector palette. And let me, again, take that full height so I have a little bit more room for my tools. You'll see that the transformation functions are right here, right? There's zoom, which is scale, yes. Uh, position. We even have pitch and yaw. Okay, so there. There's your pitch, right? There's your yaw. These are all the little 2D DVE things that are all just right here within the inspector. Every one of these attributes can be individually reset. They can be keyframed, and you can do a global reset if you want. Like if you've made a mistake, I have made a terrible mistake. Let's just reset the whole thing to back to normal. Uh, some of the transform tools are best. Um, uh, well, I wouldn't say best. I would say that there is a number of ways to adjust these these tools and their parameters. And um, I did toggle the little diamonds, right? That indicates that we've set a keyframe. You'll see that what that's done here on the clip itself is giving me this little indicator that there are keyframes now. And if I click the keyframe button, you'll see keyframes right in line with the clip in my linear timeline, which I find to be incredibly useful. So there's my transform keyframe. And in fact, maybe I... I want to I want to tween my transformation here, my pitch, which is currently um, showing me an indicator. See this arrow marker here in the transform tools of the inspector. The arrow marker is my navigation back to my keyframe. So just know that we'll give you navigation to your keyframe. Let's just say that we're going to pitch it this far. All right. So um, there it is. And yeah, I mean it's an iMac Pro, and I'm doing it over I don't know however long that is, right? But um, yeah, it's a 10 second clip, 10 and a half second clip. You can see that that played in real time. In fact, that plays most things in real time. A lot of the transformation tools that we do are, are in real time because we like to draw on the power of the GPU. I showed at the very beginning when we're in the preferences file that I can, I can decide how many GPUs that I want to address. I can decide the types of, um, you know, whether I'm using OpenGL, uh, OpenCL, CUDA, or other. So let's just look at system and memory and GPU again. You'll see that auto, auto is, by, is by default, auto is there, and it finds the one card that I have in this one system. But if I had uh, an expansion chassis and five other cards or six other cards, we can actually stack up to nine cards. And we run on Macintosh, we run on Windows, we run on Linux. And it's most of the people that are running you know, six cards are doing so on Linux, to be honest. But um, we guarantee that you're going to be able to get three of them easily on any Mac system, on any Windows system, and they're totally supported at three GPUs. So you can stack GPUs. The fact that we that we draw on the GPU for, for the render power, for the real-time capabilities, uh, just makes it so much more fluid you know, to edit and to tweak and to just be creative because of the iterative uh, you know, potential that you have without having to stop and render, without having to export something or drop into proxy or things like that. So uh, yeah, I did something amazing. I saved the picture. 
But here, let's show you <laughs> now, uh, now that I've got this keyframe, that I can actually adjust the keyframe right here in this view. I don't have to go back to the inspector for that. I don't need a separate timeline for that. If, if I just wanted to make a specific point where that's the keyframe that absolutely has to happen from, you know, from here to there, then there it is. I've, I've made my little tween, and you know, I'm just going to hit play, obviously. Um, yes, it should play back in real time, right? 16 gig GPU in here. I agree, it should, and it does. Um, I can actually do a lot more than this. I'm just showing this as the option. So transformation tools in the inspector, also keyframe tools in the edit timeline. Uh, if you look right next to this little keyframe icon on that clip, we can show you that we actually have a full keyboard curve here um, uh, to control the animation quality from those keyframes. So if I said, uh, let's take that keyframe and then let's ease, ease out. This is not only adjusting, but actually giving me access to the Bezier handle. So there. I can just adjust that. Um, I can do that right within the edit timeline. I, these, are, these are transformation controls that I'm actually pulling off from the edit timeline. And let's, let's just reset that before it, uh, it makes me ill, because I did such a wonderful job. So uh, we have some composite modes, as you'll see up here, right? Typical style, if I were to have, say, A over B, uh, clip A here in V2. Um, these are composite modes, transformation modes, right? So color burn, color dodge, the opacity. Every one of these attributes that you can see that I'm looking at here, every one of these attributes with a diamond is something that we can control with, uh, with animation. And uh, just know that the inspector is where you're going to find all of these controls. I didn't really talk about dynamic zoom, so let's go ahead and show you the dynamic zoom here. Let's move out of the way. And uh, dynamic zoom on this clip, for instance. I will enable it right there. And then I'm going to turn on the overlay so you can see what dynamic zoom controls look like in this viewer. And I'm going to say here, linear, ease in and out. And that's essentially green is go, right? So that's my start frame, and red is stop, so that's my ending frame. So if I just move back here and start playing it back, you see that it's actually performing that transformation for me across the length of that clip. And that's important to know because it's essentially, um, it's, doing, it's doing all of that for me. And if I just extend that clip, then it will just extend the animation across the new duration of that clip. It's just going to handle all that for me. Um, very simply, if I wanted to reframe that, I can swap and do the opposite. Right. So now here we go, and we're actually we're actually transforming in. In uh, here, let's turn that on because I turned it off again. Right. There we go. Here's your tools. So you can see start and stop frames are actually now the the start frame is the full frame, and then we're eventually going to slowly punch in here. So let's just shorten that clip so you can see that it actually gets there. There we go. Right, so there we go, we, we pushed in. We didn't push in enough, in my opinion, so let's show you what that looks like. Let's just say, that's my new frame, right there. So it just handled the transformation for me. It did so based on the duration of my clip. It's a really simple way of just adding those, you know, nice, I don't know what you want to call them, like Ken Burns style, uh, you know, push in out, right? Very good, thank you. Um, so before I, before I get too carried away, because I do get carried away, uh, I don't want to filibuster in here tonight, all right? Um, let me jump into, uh, into color tools. There's a few things in the color tools that are different. Um, if you're familiar with, with DaVinci Resolve already, you know that we started as a color corrector, started as a color grading system, you know, a high-end suite that came with a, a rack of gear six feet tall. Um, it was also three quarters of a million dollars, right? It's now a little bit cheaper, right? OK. Uh, and <laughs> yeah, you think so too. Good, good. And, and we just keep stuffing new features into it. So if you look at what's in the color page, we still have all these legendary color tools available. And in addition to that, we've been writing OpenFX plugins that we call Resolve Effects. So if you're looking for uh, you know, some, some effects, and in many cases, real time, uh, everything that you see on this side that's indicated with a GPU is actually GPU enabled for acceleration. So, you know, dust busting, uh, deflicker, patch replacing. Patch replacing is fun here. Let's just add patch replacing. 
Oh, you notice I actually added that effect in as a node by itself. I didn't have to drag it over a node. That's just something that I do sometimes to keep my nodes separate. Right? In a color workflow, you might have one node for your primary correction. You might have the next node for a specific correction or a secondary. Um, I'll do the same thing when I add OFX. I just add them in line and move them over to the line, and, and they patch for themselves. And now I just have this one node as the patch replacer. So here's the patch replacer, and let's just say that you know we just wanted to stick a, a shadow of his head here. I'm sure he's he's going to move a little bit. So um, I'm going to go into the tracker and add an effects tracker. And track his nose. he moves, right? So what this indicates here, and I don't need to bother backing up and tracking the whole thing, is you can see what it's actually doing. Um, that patch replace is doing a simple clone. And you can change the shape of the patch, right? This is a ellipse-shaped region. Um, it's, here, let's go back to OpenFX Overlay. Um, it's customizable this way. This is a very, very simple paint out clone function that we have that we've added, and it's right here in the color page, and not a lot of people know that it exists. So if you look in this library, you'll see that there's about 50 of these resolve effects, and they all come with the studio version. And um, there's, there's a free version, of course, you know, because if 300 is just, just outside the range of what you want to pay, uh, there is a free version, okay? And you can actually do work on the free version, because we don't really limit it that much. Um, one of the things that Resolve is, is good at is, because I said we draw on the GPU, you throw GPU horsepower at it, you could put a 16K frame in here. And you, in fact, you can go 16384 by 16384 square at 120 frames in the studio version. But in the limited <clears throat> free version, right, you're limited to 3840 by 2160. You're limited to UHD at 60 frames. So if you need anything over UHD 60, then you do need the studio version. And again, talking about these resolve effects, there's 50 of them or 51. Uh, about half of those are going to be locked to the studio only version. So just know that you'll be able to play with them on the free version. You can go to our website and download it and just start messing around. In fact, all of those project files are fully compatible with the studio version. So once you get to the studio version, if you've used some of these that would be locked by the studio, they'll simply enable. You'll just see your plugins. You won't have to replace them. It's not like uh, we don't you know, work together with our own software. So just keep that in mind. Uh, beautiful things in the color page. I'd be happy to show you some more specific stuff later, and, and so will Sarah. Uh, I want to show you a little tiny bit in Fusion, because Fusion is the big question mark, and it's the one thing that we added, uh, the biggest thing that we added. And I'm just going to spend the last couple minutes that I have Matt here doing this. So you give me the, give me the sign. Um, <clears throat> I've got a few, a few open right here. That's another thing I wanted to show you. You've probably seen a single project open at once, and, and maybe your system really only wants to work on one project at one time. But we can actually have multiple projects open. It's called dynamic project switching. So know that if you needed a copy from one timeline into another timeline in a completely different project somewhere else, you can do that. You can just have multiple timelines and multiple projects open. So I want to show, um, I'm going to show the fusion stuff real quick. Now, um, let me pop back to the edit timeline. <clears throat> Again, same, same pages of our workflow, and um, a couple of methods that we might use Fusion in between, right? So here's just a color page thing using patch replace, and I just wanted to show you that because you know, clearly there's only one of those wind socks in that, in that shot, and uh, you know, here I am faking the scene, there's two of them now, right? And patch replace is pretty seamless when you get it right, um, and, and it can work for a lot of things, maybe really fast. You didn't necessarily need to do a full paint clone, right? You can just pop into the color page. But there are other things that you might want to do in, say, Fusion, right? Now, this is just a simple track, right? I just tracked that little bulb as it comes into focus, and as I, as I track its motion, its delicate little motion, I just created a, a little title sequence animation that says, hay fever, comes up, it resolves, right? No pun intended here. And, uh, and, and then we see that it's, it's attached in it, and it looks natural. This is a really simple process. If I move into Fusion, you'll see that Fusion clip that I have just has these nodes. Now, nodes are just building a flow chart. Okay, so it just builds from the first node into the next node. And there's outputs from one node and inputs to another node. So think of it like you're building a flow chart. Your, your VFX pipeline is just 
is just a flow chart. It's pretty simple to look at this way. If it makes sense to you to stack them vertically, top, bottom, cool, do that. Um, by default, it might you know, draw wherever it draws. Just know that when you're looking at the merge, uh, green indicates the, uh, the foreground, right? So if you've merged something simply, A over B, green input is your foreground. As you hover over it, it'll even tell you that. It's your foreground element. So just know that you can hover over things, you can click, and you'll see at the bottom right hand, I'm sorry, the bottom left hand corner over here, it'll say frame size, say 1920, 1080, et cetera. It gives you all the relevant details just hovering over. So um, again, visual cues, feedback. So all I did was I created a text element, and I'm going to hit the one on the keyboard to show it up here in the viewer, right? So there's, there's my text element, and it's got its own attributes. It's got its animation, right, the write-on, it's got the blur, it's got, you know, whatever I've done to, to make it look so amazing, right, clearly, sexy, totally. Um, there it is, and if I show you keyframes and spline control, this is actually additional options that you didn't see in the flow, right? The flow is just this flow chart. It's like the, it's like the overview. It's, it's, the, um, you know, it's the design of my animation itself. But this is where I get into the nuts and bolts. So look at this, this is keyframes. I have a keyframe viewer that just shows me a linear timeline and all of my elements. There's my text. Those are the keyframes. There's the tweening that's happening in the animation itself in between those keyframes. So I can simply reposition and retime things by adjusting my keyframes. Now, if I move the keyframe panel away again, and I want to show you the spline, because again, there's my text, and there's the attributes that actually give me the control over the, the spline, the quality of the animation itself, not the timing of the animation, right? So I've got multiple tools, multiple palettes, multiple options for controlling the, not just the timing of the animation, the animation itself, the, the quality of the animation, and then, as, as a general overview, the node flow, which really just shows me how everything's connected. So there it is, text, this element, there's my output, it's feeding into a shadow element that I just created, and then I fed the result of that, text plus shadow, into the foreground of a tracker. Now this would normally be a merge node here, but this is a tracker, and because our tools actually can do multiple things, I actually just used one tracker node, tracked this element, and you can see the track data here, and then I switch to my track tool from track to match move, and I fed the resulting text that I've animated into the foreground of my tracker. And so great, now composite this over my, my background, which is my media in one, which is the source clip right here. So one, we'll show you the source clip again. So there's my source, I've just stacked two things on top of it. The result is being merged and fed over here in the media out. That's my return to resolve. So when I go back to Resolve in the edit page, you'll see there's my, well, actually, that's a different flip entirely. Here, there we go. You'll see, and let's turn off this overlay. Don't need it. That's what I did, and it turned red, right? You'll see above the timeline right now, it's turned red, and it's writing itself to cache because by default, if it's a fusion clip in the edit page, I've got a preference that's turned on that says, if it's a fusion clip in the edit page, cache it for me, just write it to disk somewhere, and then pull it back and read it back. Um, it's just as simple to pop back into Fusion and change it if I want to, so it's not like I'm ever stuck. It's not like I wrote something to the disk that I'm never gonna use, and it's essentially writing to disk in, a, in an internal format that's, that's like a, a frame-based format. So if you only need to change the middle 10 frames of your animation, you change the middle 10 frames, the other frames aren't invalidated. So it's not like you have to rebuild the entire cache. So there's, there's some very, uh, very cool stuff that we can do here. Where did I find Fusion? Oh, uh, Fusion. If you look at the very, very bottom, Media, Edit, Fusion is next, and then Color, then Fairlight. So, see? We're off screen. All right, so watch, watch this. Here. Here. Ah, okay. Re readjust. There's Fusion, right at the bottom. And again, I use keyboard shortcuts for everything. That's Shift-2 for media, Shift-4 for edit, Shift-5 for fusion, right? Shift-6 to move to the color page. Yes, fusion is in the free version as well, yeah. As is Fairlight. I mean, I know I kind of glossed over Fairlight, and we were talking a little bit about, especially, you know, 
uh, talking about Fairlight earlier and how it was, it's a legacy system. Well, we have the full digital audio workstation in here in software, and we've, we've come out with our own Fairlight control panels that are, that are nearing completion. They're almost ready. So you're definitely going to be able to see those if you visit us at NAB. We'll have them on the show floor. Um, I will be there at NAB. You can't miss me. I'm probably the very first pod everyone's going to run over. All right? So I will try to recognize all of you when you see me there. OK? <laughs> but uh, that's my time. I hope you enjoyed this. And please welcome the next group that's coming up. Thank you.